all over this unhappy globe, there are heroic volunteers putting up a selfless battle on behalf of the wretched of the earth. But only one of these is considered to have invisible means of support, to be nothing less than a saint. What makes Teresa of Calcutta so divine? Long before Mother Teresa's helicopter touched down at about 20 past 11 this morning, the crowds were gathering here at Knock. Among all of you who have made this pilgrimage to Knock this afternoon, we are privileged to have with us as a special guest at this Mass a pilgrim who has come from afar, a woman whose worldwide symbol for goodness and holiness. We Not many claims made by the Irish clergy are widely or uncritically accepted, even in Ireland. But the saintliness of an Albanian nun named Agnes Boyacu is a proposition that's accepted by many who are not even believers. Mother Teresa herself receives extravagant adulation as no more than her due. Of all the women in recent history, no one has captured the public imagination like Teresa of Calcutta. I'm not being facetious, and I'm certainly making no comparison when I say that no woman has made such an impact here since Our Lady herself appeared in 1879. So how did this auction of hyperbole and credulity get started? In that year of grace, 1969, the scrupulously neutral and objective British Broadcasting Corporation permitted that old fraud and mountebank Malcolm Muggeridge to pay a devotional visit to the Calcutta Shrine. Altruza, when after I met you in London, really the only thing I wanted to do was to come and see you in your work here. Now I've seen it. And of course it's a, it's a shining light. Himself arrogant, almost to the point of humility, Muggeridge became persuaded that he and his team had become the divinely appointed instruments of what he claimed was the first television miracle. During uh, Something Beautiful from God, we, there was an episode where we um, were taken to uh, a building that Mother Teresa called the House of the Dying. And Peter Schaefer, the director, said, uh, well, we, it's very dark in here. Do you think we can get anything? And we had just taken delivery at the BBC of some new film made by Kodak, which we hadn't had time to test before we left. So I said to Peter, well, let's have a go. So we shot it. And when we got back several weeks later, a month or two later, we're sitting in the, in the Rushes Theatre at Eden Studios, and eventually up came the shots of the House of the Dying. And it was surprising. You could see every detail. And I said, that's amazing, that's extraordinary. And I was going to go on to say, you know, three cheers for Kodak. I didn't get a chance to say that, though, because Malcolm, sitting in the front row, spun round and said, it's divine light. It's Mother Teresa. You'll find that it's divine light, old boy. And three or four days later, I found I was being phoned by journalists from London newspapers who were saying things like, we hear you've just come back from India with Martin Mugridge and you were the witness of a miracle. And a star was born. This profane marriage between tawdry media hype and medieval superstition gave birth to an icon which few have since had the poor taste to question. It's like uh, you're, you're, you're actually seeing a living saint. Give a man a reputation as an early riser, said Mark Twain, and that man can sleep till noon. How does the reputation of Holy Mother Teresa look if, just for a moment, we switch off Malcolm Muggeridge's kindly light? Mother Teresa is a Nobel Prize winner, she's a symbol, people in the West talk about her, so Indians adopt her at that level. The fact that what she does on the streets of Calcutta is really irrelevant to them. They couldn't care about it, and most of them don't even know. But Mother Teresa is the sort of figure you show to visitors. Mother Teresa's flagship institution 
is her home for the dying, a hospice which purportedly sweetens the last moments of otherwise destitute lives. My initial impression was of all the photographs and footage I've ever seen of Belson and places like that because all the patients had shaved heads. There are no chairs anywhere, they're just these stretcher beds and they're like First World War stretcher beds. There's no garden, no yard even, no nothing. And I thought, what is this? This is, a, this is two rooms with 50 to 60 men in one, 50 to 60 women in another. They're dying. They're not being given a great deal of medical care. They're not being given painkillers really beyond aspirin and maybe if you're lucky some brufen or something for, them, for the sort of pain that goes with terminal cancer and, and the things that they were dying of. And I thought, what's the point? Right from the very beginning, I wanted to serve the poor purely for the love of God and to give them what the rich people get with money. I wanted to give to the poor for the love of God. They didn't have enough drips. Um, the needles they used and reused over and over and over, and you would see some of the nuns um, rinsing needles in co under the cold water tap. And I asked one of them why she was doing it. And she said, well, to clean it. And I said, yes, but why are you not sterilizing it? Why are you not boiling um, water and sterilizing your needles? She says, there's no point. There's no time. Mother Teresa's cult of death and suffering depends for its effect on the most vulnerable and helpless, abandoned babies, say, or the terminally ill, who supply the occasions for charity and the raw material for demonstrations of compassion. The first day I was there when I'd finished working in the um, women's ward, I went and waited on the edge of the men's ward for my boyfriend uh, who was looking after a boy of 15 who was dying and an American doctor told me that she had been trying to treat this boy and that he had a really relatively simple kidney complaint that had simply got worse and worse and worse because he hadn't had antibiotics and he actually needed an operation. I don't recall what the problem was, she did tell me. And she was so angry, but also very resigned, which so many people become in that situation. She said, well, they won't take him to hospital. And I said, why? All you have to do is get a cab, take him to the nearest hospital, demand that he has treatment, get him an operation. She said, they don't do it. They won't do it if they do it for one, they do it for everybody. And I thought, but this kid's 15. 